What is Planet Nine? Planet Nine is an object that we believe lives in the solar system beyond the orbit of Neptune. It orbits the sun with a period of about 10,000 years and uh, is about five Earth masses. So that's a hypothesized object. That's There's right. some evidence uh, for this kind of object. There's a bunch of different explanations. Can you give like an overview of the planets in our solar system? How many are there? What do we know and not know about them? at a high level. All right, that sounds like a good plan. So look, the solar system basically is comprised of two parts, the inner and the outer solar system. The inner solar system has the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Now, Mercury is about 40% of the orbital separation of the, where the Earth is. It's closer to the sun, Venus is about 70%. Uh, then Mars is about 160% further away from the sun than is the earth. These planets that we, uh, one of them we occupy, right, are pretty small, okay? They're to leading order, sort of heavily overgrown asteroids, if you will. <laughs> um, okay. And this, is, this becomes evident when you move out further in the solar system and encounter Jupiter, which is 316 earth masses, right, 10 times the size, um, you know, and Saturn is another huge one, it's 90 Earth masses at about 10 times uh, the separation from uh, the sun as is the Earth. And then you have Uranus and Neptune at 20 and 30, respectively. For a long time, that is where the kind of massive part of the solar system ended. But what we've learned in the last 30 years is that Beyond Neptune, there's this expansive field of icy debris, a second icy asteroid belt uh, in the solar system. A lot of people have heard of the asteroid belt, which lives be between Mars and Jupiter, right? Like that's a pretty common thing that people like to imagine and draw on lunchboxes and stuff. Mm -hmm. But beyond Neptune, there's a much more massive, and much more radially uh, expansive uh, field of debris. Pluto, by the way, it belongs to that second, you know, icy asteroid belt, which we call the Kuiper belt. It's just a big object within that population of bodies. Well, Pluto the planet. Pluto the the dwarf planet, the former planet, you know. Why is Pluto not a planet anymore? I mean, it's tiny. We used so to size matters when it comes oh, to planets. A hundred percent. 100%. It's a, actually a fascinating story. When Pluto was discovered in 1930, the, th the reason it was discovered in the first place is because astronomers at the time were looking for a seven Earth mass planet somewhere beyond Neptune. Okay? It was hypothesized that such an object exists. When they found something, they interpreted that as a seven Earth mass planet and immediately revised its mass downward because they couldn't resolve the object with the telescope. So it looked like a just a point mass, you know, star mm -hmm. rather than a physical disk. And they said, well, maybe it's not seven, maybe it's one, right? And then sort of over the next, um, you know, I guess 40 years, Pluto's mass kept getting revised down, downwards, downwards, downwards until uh, it was realized that it's like 500 times less massive than the Earth. Yeah. Right? I mean, like Pluto's surface area is almost perfectly equal to the surface area of Russia, mm -hmm. actually. And, you know, Russia is big, but it's not a planet. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, actually, we can we can touch more on that. That's, <laughs> that's another discussion. Uh, so in, in some sense, earlier in the century, Pluto represented kind of our ignorance about the edges of the solar system. And perhaps Planet Nine is the thing that represents our ignorance about now the modern set of ignorances about the edges of our solar system. That's a good way to put it. By the way, just imagining this belt mm -hmm. of astro of debris at the, at the edge of our solar system is incredible. Yeah. Um, can you talk about it a little bit? What is the Kuiper belt and what it, what is the Oort cloud? Yeah, okay, so look, the simple way to think about it is that if you imagine, you know, Neptune's orbit like a circle, right? Kind of, uh, maybe a factor of one and a half, 1.3 uh, times bigger 
uh, on, a, on a radius of one, 1. 1.3 times bigger, you've got a whole collection of icy objects. Most of these objects are sort of the size of Austin, you know, maybe maybe a little bit smaller. If you then zoom out, right, and explore the orbits of the most long period Kuiper Belt object, these are the things that have the biggest orbits and take the longest time to go around the sun, then what you find is that beyond a critical orbit size, beyond a critical orbit period, which is about 4,000 years, you start to see weird structure. Like all the orbits sort of point into one direction. And all the orbits are kind of tilted in the same way, by about 20 degrees with respect to the sun. This is particularly pronounced in orbits that are not heavily affected by Neptune. So there you start to see this weird dichotomy where there are objects which are stable, okay, which, are, which Neptune does not mess with gravitationally, and unstable objects. The unstable objects are basically all over the place because they're being you know, kicked around by Neptune. The stable uh, orbits show this remarkable pattern of clustering. We, back I guess five years ago, interpreted this pattern of clustering as a gravitational one-way sign the existence of a planet in a distant planet, right? Something that is shepherding and confining these orbits together. Of course, right, you have to have some skepticism when you're when you're talking about uh, these things. You have to ask the question of, okay, how statistically significant is this clustering? And there, there are many authors that have indeed called that into question. We have done our own analyses. And basically, just like with all statistics where, you know, there's kind of like, you know, multiple ways to uh, do the exercise, mm -hmm. you can either ask the question of if I have a telescope that has, you know, uh, surveyed this part of the sky, what are the chances that I would discover this clustering? And that basically tells you that you have zero confidence, right? Like that's not, that does not give you a confident answer one way or another. Another way to do the statistics, which is what we prefer to do, is to take to say, we have a whole night sky mm -hmm. of discoveries in the Kuiper belt, right? And if we have some object over there, which has right ascension and declination, which is a way to say it's there on the sky, and it has some brightness, that means somebody looked over there and discovered an object of was able to discover an object of that brightness or brighter. Mm -hmm. Through that analysis, you can construct a whole map on the sky of kind of where all of the surveys that have ever been done have collectively looked. So if you do the exercise this way, the false alarm probability of the clustering on which the Planet 9 hypothesis is built is about 0.4%. Wow. Okay. So there's a million questions here. One, when you say bright objects, why why are they bright? Are we talking about actual objects within the Kuiper belt or the stuff we see through the Kuiper belt? This is the actual stuff we see in the Kuiper belt. The way you go about discovering Kuiper belt objects, pretty easy. I mean, it's easy in theory, right? Hard in practice. Yeah. All you do is you take snapshots of the sky, right? Choose that direction, say, and take, you know, a high exposure snapshot. Mm -hmm. Then you wait a night and you do it again. And then you wait another night and you do it again. Objects that are just random stars in the galaxy don't move mm -hmm. on the sky, whereas objects in the solar system will slowly move. This is no different than if you're driving down the freeway, it looks like you know trees are going by you faster than the clouds, right? Mm -hmm. This is parallax. That's it. It's just they're reflecting light off of the sun and it's going back and hitting the there's a little bit of a glimmer from the different objects that you can see based on the reflection from the sun. So like there, there's actual light, yep. but it's not darkness. That's right. These are just big icicles basically that are just reflecting sunlight back at you. It's then easy to understand why it's so hard to discover them because light has to travel to, you know, something like 40 times the distance um, <laughs> uh, between the earth and the sun and then get reflected back. Was that like an hour travel or uh, yeah that's right that's something like that because they the earth to the sun is eight minutes i believe um and so something you know yeah, hours, in, yeah. yeah in that in that order of magnitude so mm -hmm. that's interesting 
So you have to like account for all of that. And then there's this huge amount of data, pixels that are coming from the pictures. And you have to uh, integrate all of that together yeah. to paint a sort of like a high estimate of the different objects. Can you track them? Can you be like, that's Bob? Like, can you like? Yes, exactly. In fact, uh, one of them is, is named Joe Biden. <laughs> I mean, I'm not like this is not even a joke, right? Okay, it's, is there a Trump one or no? No, no, I don't, I, well, <laughs> not actually, yet. I don't know. I haven't checked for 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 <laughs> that, but uh, like w the way it works is if you discover one, oh. you right away get a license plate for it. Okay, mm. so like the first four numbers is the first year that this object has appeared on, you know, uh, in the data set, if you will, and then um, there's like this code that follows it, um, which basically tells you where in the sky it is, right? So one of the really interesting Kuiper Belt objects, which is very much part of the Planet Nine story, is called uh, VP113, because Joe Biden was vice president at the time, you know, got nicknamed Biden. Um, <laughs> VP113, said? Yeah. <laughs> he got nicknamed Biden. Beautiful. What's the fingerprint for any particular object? Like, how do you know it's the same one? Okay. Or you just kind of like, yeah, from night to night, you take a picture, how do you know it's the same object? Yeah, so the way you know is it appears in almost exactly the same part of the sky, but except for bit. move, but it moves by. And this is why actually you need at least three nights, because oftentimes asteroids, which are much closer to the Earth, like will um, appear to move only slightly, but then on the third night we'll move away. So that third night is really there to detect acceleration. Mm -hmm. Now, the um, the thing that I didn't really realize until you know I started observing together with my partner in crime and all this, Mike Brown, is just the fact that for the first year when you make these detections, the only thing you really know with confidence is where it is on the night sky and how far away it is, mm -hmm. okay? That's it, you don't know anything about the orbit because over three days, the object just moves so little, right? The That whole motion on the sky is entirely coming from motion of the Earth, mm -hmm. right? So the Earth is kind of the car, the object is the tree and you see it move. Yeah. So then to get some confident information about what its orbit looks like, you have to come back a year later um, and then measure it again. Oh, interesting. So do yeah. three nights, then come back a year later and do another three nights. Yeah. So you get the velocity, the acceleration from the three nights, and then you have the maybe- The additional. The, the, the additional yeah. information. Because an orbit is basically described by six parameters. So you at least need six independent points, but in reality, you need m many more observations to, to really pin down the orbit well. And from that, you're able to construct for that one particular object, an orbit, and then there's, of course, like how many objects are there? There's there like four-ish thousand now. But like the, in the future, that could be like millions? Oh, sure, oh, sure. So if, in fact, these things are hard to predict, but there's a new observatory called the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is coming online maybe next year. I mean, with COVID, these things are yeah. a little bit more uncertain, but um, they've actually been making great progress uh, with construction. And so that uh, telescope is just gonna sort of scan the night sky um, every day automatically. And it's just, it's such an efficient survey that it might um, increase the census of the distant Kuiper belt, the things that I'm interested in by a factor of a hundred. I mean, that would be, that would be really cool. And uh, yeah, that's a that's an incredible. Yeah. Uh, they, I mean, they might just find Planet Nine. Too. I mean, that's <laughs> like almost like literally pictures, like visually. I mean, sure, yeah. Like the first detection you make, all you know is where it is in the sky and how mm -hmm. far away it is. If something is, you know, five hundred times away from the sun, as far away from the sun as is the Earth, you know that's Planet Nine. That's when the story concludes. And then uh, you can study it. Now you can study it. Yeah. yeah. By the way. I'm gonna use that as like, I don't know, a pickup line or a dating strategy, like see the person for three days and then don't see them at all and then see them again in, in a year to determine the orbit. And over time, you figure out if sort of uh, from a cosmic perspective, 
this this whole thing works <laughs> yeah. out. I have no dating advice to give. I was gonna, <laughs> I was going to use this as a metaphor to uh, to somehow yeah. to uh, map it onto the human condition. 